welcome everybody to the 2021 David Jones Joe Green Memorial and Lecture. Um, I guess nobody would have thought this time last year, we, th we all thought we were lucky that we'd managed to get the event in before COVID took over as lives and, and locked everything down. And at that time, we all anticipated that we'd be meeting, you know, in a physical form back at the miners' offices in Barnsley, as we've always have done. Unfortunately, things uh, have not worked out that way, and we're now attempting to, to do a, a digitised David Jones Joe Green Memorial, because we do feel that it is important that we do continue to mark the event, you know, with, with respect for the two lads that lost their lives on the picket line during the strike. So I'd like to welcome everybody to this year's event. Thank you all for, for taking the time to catch up with technology and, uh, and, and join us. And our speaker this year, um, it gives me great pleasure to announce is Ken Loach. Uh, we have tried a few times in the past to, to get Ken to do this event, but unfortunately because of his restricted diary, um, we weren't able to. So I suppose there's only one good thing that's come out of COVID-19 is that this has given us the opportunity to have Ken address this year's David Jones Joe Green Memorial. So I uh, hand over to you, Ken, and, uh, and welcome. Uh, thanks very much, Chris. And uh, it's a real honour to, to be able to um, say a few words and to um, remember um, not only um, David Jones and, and Joe Green, but also the, the privations and the hardship that so many people went through during that strike. Um, it was a pivotal event. I think it was the most important political events since the end of the war, politically, and in terms of the Labour movement. Um, but certainly we, we should remember David Jones, who was only 24, and Joe Green, 55. And they're absolutely the, the victims of that onslaught that the miners felt and suffered in the early 1980s. So respect to them and respect to everyone who took part in that strike. Um, it's, I'm sad I'm not with you in, in, the, in Barnsley. Um, would have been a great day and I'd look forward to it. Um, but I, I thought it might be useful um, to just go over the main, the main elements of, of what happened, why it happened and the consequences because it's really important that we keep these memories alive and our understanding of them alive. Um, and the, the, the great um, Czech writer talked of the struggle of memory against forgetting. And that's the struggle we're engaged in constantly. It's the struggle of memory, of our memory, of our knowledge of what has happened in the long history of our the struggle of the labor movement, uh, we keep that memory alive. And there's no memory more worth, has to be kept alive than the, than the memory of that strike and the part that everyone played in it. So first of all, why, why did it happen? I guess it happened because in the seventies, British business felt it was under threat. Profits were not as great as they wanted. There was a great campaign against organized labor Elections were fought on the slogan, who governs Britain, i.e. in their eyes, the elected government or trade unions was the myth. And that culminated in Thatcher's victory in 79. And she had a three pronged attack to, to reduce the power of organised labour and to make workers more vulnerable so that their, the rate of exploitation could increase. And she had a three-pronged attack. It was, first of all, let unemployment rip. Cut back the subsidies to uh, businesses that weren't making a profit anyway, or would, would struggle to make a profit. Cut the subsidies, let them go, let them go bust, the kind of raw 19th century capitalism. Let them go bust, let the unemployment queues lengthen. And they very quickly got to over 3 million, massive amount of unemployed people. Secondly, there were laws against trade unions. That was the second prong. So it was harder to organize. 
um, reduce the number of pickets, impose secret ballots so that you can't take a collective decision when you listen to the arguments, um, and destroy solidarity action. So you can't take solidarity action to support other workers in struggle. And, and a fundamental principle of the labor movement, the laws. And then the third element in an armory were the set piece strikes. And the set piece strikes began to set up a union to either uh, resist or be defeated. And she began with the weakest unions, the weakest unions, the steel, the steel workers. The steel workers faced inflation going through the roof and a tiny wage increase. Um, they took strike action, but I don't think they'd, they'd struck for many years. Uh, one of the um, steel workers um, said to me, a lovely man called Ray Davis, no longer with us from South Wales. He said that uh, we were so ignorant, people, people rang the union office to see if there was a handbook on picketing. Um, and they went like lambs to the slaughter. Um, there was uh, the possibility of a, an alliance with the railway workers, ignored. Um, the, um, the leader of the steel workers, uh, Bill Sears, <laughs> um, turned that down, got them back to work. Um, and the railwaymen then moved their turn, they fought alone too. So that was the steel workers. And then the, the car industry, uh, many others, smaller factories were shut. Remember Lawrence Scott's in Manchester. Um, great resistance put up by the workforce. Union leaders did a deal, closed it, and the police kicked them out in the end with the backing of the union leaders. Um, the car workers, um, a, a plan to modernize, uh, which of course meant job cuts, and, uh, and greater exploitation, um, resisted by the car workers, led by Derek Robinson, nicknamed Red Robbo. I'm sure many people will remember him. Sacked, got rid of, again with the collusion of union leaders. And then, of course, they didn't go for the, the strongest union, which was your union, which was the miners. Uh, you, as one, um, um, one trade unionist organizer said to me at the time, you don't go for people who are going to rip your throats out first. Um, and that was the case. And the mines were set up to be the last men standing and women standing. So that was her, that was her program, that, those three prongs. But she had a secret weapon. And the secret weapon, ironically, were the labor leaders and the union leaders themselves because they didn't, they didn't use the militancy that was available, the militancy that, that would have occupied the factions, that would, have, that would have resisted this onslaught. They colluded with it. And uh, they sold jobs and they didn't end the closures. So that when the miners were there standing, standing to, 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 to resist, the union leaders themselves had colluded and how would they then defend the miners when they'd sold jobs themselves? And that, that's a key lesson, I think, that, 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 that is a key point in, in that. And of course, they were joined, as we know, to their eternal shame by the Labour Party leaders themselves, Kinnock and Hattersley. We heard um, that Hattersley had spoken at one union private meeting of a, of a trades council where he said, it would be disastrous if the miners won. And that, 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 that il we didn't need him to say that because that illustrated their attitude. They, they, because if the miners had won, the trade unions would have been stronger. And when that Labour leadership got in power, well, some chance with Kinnock, but when the, if that Labour leadership had ever got in power, they would have had to deal with a strong trade union movement and their interest was business. Business interest first, and the crumbs will dispose rather more, rather more equitably than the Tories. So that, that was Thatcher's secret weapon. That, that, was her, that was her fourth weapon, were the Labour and trade union leaders. And the irony, of course, in all this was that the, they were presented and allowed themselves to be presented as the union barons, these great titans of the Labour movement. Um, the union barons kind of... Uh, excoriated in the press and on BBC and radio 
Um, the, the people of great strength, you know, could hold the country to ransom. You know, how often have we heard that phrase? In reality, they were doing the opposite. And, and that's the irony of, of, of that uh, uh, situation. Um, but then um, turning to the strike itself, and I, I, I can't say much about this because you all know this far better than I do. And the, um, and the memory of it and the scars of it and the, the, the good that came out of it uh, perversely um, it will, is stronger in your memories than in anyone's. Um, but the, I mean, we know the, the terrible hardship and the terrible privation and the splits in the families and the and the terrible experience that you know better than anyone. Um, it, it was the best, it was, well, Dickens read the best of times, the worst of times. I mean, to my mind, it was the worst far outweighs the best. But there were, there were fine things that came out. There was a wonderful sense of, of working class solidarity across the country, even though it's, you know, again, Lions led by donkeys yet again, um, but a wonderful sense of, of, of support and people collecting and having meetings all over the place and music events and a wonderful feeling of, of uh, that at last we had someone who was leading the fight and what a, what a necessary and just fight it was. There was a great pride in what you were doing. Um, I think, and, and, a, and a, a huge cultural outburst as well uh, of, of poetry and music and songs and, um, and, and I know a, a lot of people and particularly um, the miners' wives who must never be forgotten in this story, um, traveled and spoke at meetings and learned a strength and a, an eloquence and a passion and a, a real capacity that had maybe been hidden before. And miners too traveled and many came to where we lived and, and spoke and um, people who hadn't spoken before who weren't union officials, but really, really communicated with people. And, and that, that's a memory we've got to keep alive. We really must, because the, the point of it is that people are talented. People have ability. People have a, a, a capacity to communicate and to to raise our spirits and to share their thoughts and to, and to bring their analysis of what politics is about from the front line. And that's an essential element, must be always be an essential element of, of the labor movement, but also of our folk, of our folk memory and, and of our current practice. Listen to the people who know, because they can tell us and they know the truth. Of course, another aspect of the worst was the, the violence of the police. Terribly destructive. I mean, again, you know more about that than I do, but I, I saw Betty Cook not so long ago, the Durham Miners Girl, and I remembered how, how she was smashed with a truncheon, shattered her knee. Um, I, 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 remember, um, I remember I saw the fighters in, in the police vans as they went into the... Into the into the pit yards um, and the, the violence of a, well, there was, there was in, in the back of police vans and th there was one young miner who said, to, he said that he said to them, who gives you the right to beat me, a working class man, working class man with a stick? Who gives you the right? And we know it was Thatcher gave them the right. She organized the police or their government organized the police. Said it was a national force. The old rules didn't apply. Force, violence, and the media distortion. And while that violence was going on, the only story you heard was picket line violence. It was on the BBC and the liberal press, be expected from the far right press and the liberal press, picket line violence. And we know the truth of that. We've always known the truth of that. And we know that when, when the ruling class is up against it and they feel threatened, then they will tell any lie, any lie. And that was the lie they told. I remember Kate Aidy, who is now, you know, um, almost uh, beatified for, um, you know, what a great reporter she is, and she may well be in other circumstances. I remember her on the hillside 
Maybe it was after Aubrey, but I don't know. It was at some point saying, uh, this, the problem here is picket line violence. Picket line violence. And that's, that's our objective BBC. So we, we, we've got to reclaim this history because it is being rewritten. And the rewriting now is a cruel necessity. Oh, it was tough, you know, people suffered. Yes, of course, factory closures, mass unemployment. It was necessary. Well, no, it wasn't necessary. It was necessary for them to sustain their economic system because they only sustain it by the working class paying the price whenever it's in trouble. And that was Tladier's plan. The working class will pay the price. And the miners paid the ultimate price because they lost everything in terms of their communities, in terms of their social structures, in terms of their mutual support, in terms of, of the loyalty that is developed in, in, in the work you, you did. And, and many, 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 so many ways. So what are the lessons now? Well, as I said, the, work, the first lesson is the working class. They only maintain their system by the working class paying the price. The working, the, the, I, I dare to quote, I don't know if I dare quote Lenin, but I think he said uh, words to that effect that the, the ruling class can survive any, any crisis as long as the working class paid the price. And we, we have to remember that. When they talk about we're in it together, you know, it's, it's a comedy, isn't it? Uh, we're all in this together, you know, there's no such thing as class. Margaret Thatcher says, you know, um, we're all working class now. Yeah. yeah, well, we know which side we're on. So the, the working class will pay the price. Second lesson is that the ruling class is ruthless. They will use the full power of the state, the police, the media, the great and the good, whatever they need to use, they will use that and they'll call it a national emergency or they'll hide it or they'll use the security force, the, the intelligence, well, intelligence, a moot word there, but they, they'll, they'll use the secret services, MI, whichever it is, five or six. They, they will penetrate our, our movements. Um, the organization of the, the SCAB union was clearly an undercover operation um, and you'll all remember that. Um, to, to divide uh, to divide mining divide mining communities, um, the uh, preparation of the non-union ports to import coal. You know they they use their every weapon at their disposal. The, the the national police force already, already. So that when they provoke the strike, the miners, you 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 have no choice. You either fight it or you are defeated. And that preparation, that calculated preparation, malicious, cynical, class-driven, accepted by the labor movement leadership, absolutely ruthless. Third lesson, if I can read it, um, people count for nothing. People count for nothing. The communities were, were dis disposed of, uh, flattened. Um, now, if I can see there is an argument, we can all see the argument that sometimes they will need to be changed. Sometimes, you know, industries will need to be, will need to be developed and they will need new industries. And obviously technology advances and uh, nothing will stay the same exactly. It has to develop, has to progress. But if you care about people, if you, if you had a socialist government, they would say, well, we're going to manage this. We're going to bring investment in. There will be new industries. People won't have to spend their lives underground necessarily. It will be phased. The, the, the value of that community, these communities will be cherished. Um, and the new investment will take place over a period so that everyone is taken care of. And the, the kids grow up there and there's apprenticeships and there are, there's training and there's education. And it's, it's for people's benefit. People don't count to them. Close it down, flatten the pits, the, the, the slag heaps, remove any trace of it because don't remember the strength of your past. It didn't exist. 
didn't exist. Keep keep the wheel from the pits, you know, kind of romantic memory of, you know, some 19th century, what happened in the distant past. Don't remember the strength. Don't remember the principle stand. Don't remember the politics. You know, that, that was their intention. People don't count. Orwell had a, as always, had a phrase for it. He said, the past was erased, the erasure was forgotten, and the lie becomes the truth. And that's what they do. Forget the past, kill it, remove all traces, and the lie becomes the truth. The fourth lesson is leadership, that we, we've shown in the past, great militancy, great um, capacity to fight back. People will always fight back, and, and you you capture that more than more than any in my memory. But the leadership is not the, the militancy will evaporate like steam from a kettle, and that is driving something. And that's what that has been our struggle. That has been our struggle since the beginning of the Labour Party and, and Throughout the trade union movement, we need leadership. We need leadership that not only has the rhetoric of supporting the work of, of, of the struggle, but understands it and, 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 and represents it, represents the real independent that the, the ordinary people have. A secure job. Look, healthcare when you're sick, education for your kid. Tony Benn used to reel them off, didn't he? Pensions when you're old a secure, peaceful environment, um, and uh, now we know a, an environmentally friendly environment, because again, it, it's, it's the working class that pays the price and will pay the price if the environment collapses. Their system will not give that. Their system prioritizes profit, it prioritizes the use of natural resources, and as, as I've tried to say, it, it, it sacrifices the interests of, of ordinary people. That struggle, but the, there's, and the, the struggle of it, the, there is a, an ideological core at the heart of that failure of leadership. And it's to do with this. It is Blair's slogan said it all. Labour means business. He meant labour will roll up its sleeves. The truth is, Labour means the interest of business and everything he did. They didn't restore trade union rights. They had no program other than support business, support the profits of business. And that means the sacrifice of working class interests. And it's because of that, that split in the ideas within the labour movement that the right wing has always dominated and they stand with big business. They're not split. They stand with big business, and as long as they are in, as long as they are in the leadership, that is where we let, we will end up. So it's that struggle for leadership, and they are as ruthless. This is the last lesson, maybe. This is they are as ruthless as the Tories, and we've seen that in the the glimpse we had of an alternative with Jeremy Corbyn's election. That that glimpse that we began to see the outlines of an economy based on common ownership, on, on um, public services really belonging again to the, to the people, um, investment in the regions that are neglected with public money and public getting the benefit of, of, of the investment and the rest. We, we saw the beginnings of that transformative program and the destruction by the labour right, led by the labour right, not, of course, we expect it from the, the, the right wing press, led by the labour right, endorsed by papers like The Guardian, and absolutely led by the BBC. That destruction just shows the ruthlessness of that, the enemy within our movement, actually. You know, the, the minds were called the enemy within. The enemy within our movement is that right wing that will destroy any possibility of really building a socially just society because they stand with big business. And now we're seeing the, the consequence, we're seeing um, the Starmer period. And I think you know, this, 
we have to touch on this, I hope, in the discussion. We're seeing the, the consequences. It is now moving so far to the right. All traces of that transformative program is disappearing. And I mean, you know that, I'm sure we'll have examples. I mean, the, the joke yesterday <laughs> was um, the Tories proposed corporation tax, who opposes it? The Labour Party. Would you think you would see the day where the Tories say tax big business and Labour says, no, no, don't. I mean, it's, it, there's a comedy to that that you really couldn't make up. Um, and uh, uh, I know Gordon Brown was referred to as um, beginning as uh, Stalin and turning into Mr. Bean. Well, uh, it seems to me Keir Starmer began as Mr. Bean with his stumbling um, treatment of Brexit, which contributed to us losing the last election. But he seems to have taken lessons in party discipline from Uncle Joe, and uh, good members, long-term members have given everything to the Labour Party and now suspended, new rules invented. You can't discuss any of this in Labour Party branches. You, you're, you're, you can't, um, you, 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 you can't, you can't contradict, you, you can't criticise the leadership and you can't criticise the fact that you can't criticise the leadership. So he's gone, he's gone overnight for Mr Bean to Stalin. You know, and th this is the consequence. This is what they wanted. They've now reclaimed it and they're making up the rules so that they stay in power. Now that's, that's the consequence of a really our failure in the end to defend that chance. The, the, we, the door was pushed open. We could really have achieved something. The door was pushed open and we've allowed it to be slammed again. So it's a big struggle. It's a big struggle. However, there's, I hope there's a few things we can talk about. We've got to keep fighting. We've got to keep fighting. And next time we've got to make certain we win. But thanks very much. I hope I haven't spoken too long. I feel I have. Uh, that's fantastic. And thanks very much. I think uh, moving on and, and uh, using my... Chairman's privilege. Um, I think you have to touch on a lot of home truths there, and, and not just from the era prior to the strike, you know, and, and the start of Thatcherism and through the strike, but also right up to the present day. We've still got the same struggles that seem to be repeating themselves. We've still got a party that strives to be united, but has inherently got that left right divide where. We don't seem to be able to come together in the in the centre ground for the benefit of the party and the people we represent. It, it's always got to be a pendulum. It goes from from one extreme to the other. There, there don't seem to be any giving in the middle. Um, but just just from my point of view, one comment I'd like to I'd like to to put after after your contribution, Ken, is that as a seventeen year old at the start of the strike, to me the strike was not political. And for many miners that I stood on the picket line with, it wasn't a political dispute. We were fighting for us as right to, to maintain as communities, as employment, and for future generations. I saw you know, my time on the picket line as, as trying to protect not just my own employment, but to create employment for me, my brother that, that left school during the strike and hoped to follow me, my dad, my granddad down the pits. And unfortunately, that wasn't the case. I think one of the definitely unintended from, from Thatcher's side um, consequences of the strike was it did end up politicising many people. And as you said in your contribution, a lot of people that weren't used to public speaking and probably without the strike never would have done, but they found the voice and they, just, you know, they saw the injustice and they stood up to fight against that injustice, whereas before they might have just turned a blind eye to it and accepted that that's how life is and it's somebody else's role to, to stand up and, and be counted. So I, I do think that whilst not a political dispute, it definitely ended up into in being a dis political dispute. And there were some good that came out of it. Some, there were some very good people that, you know, that, that realized that they could stand up and fight for others and, and it, it reinforced solidarity within sections of our society that's been eroded over the last 
you know, 20, 30 years. So I'd like to open it up to, to others' contributions. I see Inky's the first one to put his hand up, so Inky. Yes, I think I found that extremely interesting to see Ken talking about sort of the way the strike developed. And yes, lots of people enjoyed to a strain in a strange sort of way the strike period because it it was based on communities. But now it can always also pointed out that we've had a problem with the trade union movement insofar as they've never totally agreed on a plan forward that was suitable for the working class. They've all sort of protected their own interests and not realizing that whilst only protecting their own interests, uh, you know, other people would get neglected and that would rebound on them. I mean, the reality is that Thatcher's and the right wing's plan was, as he Ken pointed it out, was very, very, very well planned. And the guy's name that kept coming up in there was the American McGregor, the Scottish American McGregor, who went through the steel industry, decimated that, car industry, decimated that, then come to the mining industry. The end result of all that has been a real kicking for the trade union movement and future generations. Because now we can see that uh, the sort of <coughs> industry that has replaced sort of in mining areas, you know, that has replaced industry that <coughs> meant that you're at work and at play with the same people and bread communities, that's now become more isolated. And you've got call centers packing in warehouses where they don't get chance to meet together. Whereas when we went to the pit, we also went to club. We also went to the sport field with the same people from the same industry. And I think, yes, Ken, congratulations to Ken. You pointed out something more plainly to me there than it's ever been pointed out before in that contribution. I've been aware of it but it's never been pointed out in that way before. So congratulations, Ken. And I'm talking from somebody who wasn't 17 year old during strike. I wish there was, <laughs> uh, but you know, born in the middle of the World War, lived through the industry, been in a position at union in, in the 1984 strike and the ones before it, the 72, 74, 69, and been through those periods of militancy. We have yet got to find a way of, of getting the politics to reflect the all of the working class and to convince the all of the working class that we've got a party that's going to do that. And that yet we have not achieved. I'll leave it at that, Chris. Thank you, Inky. Can I, can I bring Joel rolling in next? Joel? Hey, Ken, um, I was trying to think of a way I could um, feed a case question into this, but I've not quite managed it over the last 20 minutes. So I'll go back to uh, something more, um, maybe more uh, poignant. Um, I thought what you said about the bosses always making the working class pay is, is really important if you think about the last 12 months and what's going to come over the coming years. Because there's no way they're going to let us off, if you like, without us paying for the crisis uh, of COVID. And some bosses and some industries have done very well, thank you very much, over the last 12 months. And the one um, huge um, target, if you like, would be Amazon. Um, you only have to look out of your window now to see, you know, deliveries coming to people's houses constantly and the horrendous conditions that them workers um have to put up with you know precarious work, uh, bullying management, a lack of job satisfaction, de-skilling. Where you know it goes on and on and on, doesn't it? Um, and as Inkid and yourself talked about about having communities and thousands of workers gathering together, I think Amazon is one of them few places now when there's fulfillment centres where we see mass concentration of working class people coming together. And I just wondered what your thoughts were on. Um, any ideas or strategies on that, how we could tackle that as a trade union movement? Because even though they did try and kill us 36 years ago, we're still here 
and we're still fighting. And I think it's the big companies like that that will see the, the future of the trade union movement, hopefully. So, yeah, I'd just like your thoughts on that. I'm not expecting a magic one, by the way. I just would appreciate your thoughts. Thanks, Joe. Have you any, any thoughts off top of your head, Ken, or shall we come back? Um, well, yes, I didn't want to come in straight away. Um, the, the, I think that's a very good point. I mean, the, 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 the minor strike was the pivotal event that opened the door to all this. Um, that that and, and the, the Liverpool Dockers lockout in the 90s, uh, who again fought a you know, valiant, really valiant struggle and lasted for years. Um, and they hung on and they hung on. Um, and again, you know, let down by, um, by the TNG as it was in those days. So the, it's, a, it's a huge point. Um, and the, the move to insecure jobs, to precarious work. I mean, John McDonald, you know, made a point of saying that the first actions of a, the, if, if he and Jeremy had got, got into government would be to restore full trade union rights for everyone. And that, that would have blown a hole through the whole Amazon project. Um, I mean, it's amusing the way they call fulfillment centres, by the way. I mean, you couldn't make, I mean, that's a real Orwellian name, isn't it? I mean, you couldn't make that up. Um, I think it, it, it comes down to organisation and it's, it's, it's risking, it's a dangerous, risky business being a union organiser if, if it's done properly. Um, and, you know, far, far be, I mean, I'm sure it's way beyond my capacity now, but I mean, being there in the yards, when the vans are there, handing out the leaflets, getting chased out, um, because there is a sense, I know, because we did a, a little film about it, that there's a sense amongst the drivers that they are being reaped off. I mean, they're doing 12, 10, 11 hours a day, um, just now to get a, a basic wage. Um, they get into debt with getting their, hiring their vans or buying them. Um, they have no job security. They can be the self, so-called self-employed. They be turned off like a tap, you know. And th that's where that's where the defeat of the trade unions in the eighties has left us. And and so it's back to basic trade union organising. Now there was one candidate in the Unison election, and some of you will know him, Paul Holmes from from Yorkshire, from West Yorkshire. Um, and his program was. Don't, we don't need the big offices in London. We need to put that money into the organisers. We need them out there on the spot, knowing the situation, meeting people when the shift starts, being there when, when they, can, they can be spoken to and really organise. And that seemed to me th to match the needs of the moment. So I think, you know, let, let's, let's, let's keep an eye on that. When we can give support, give support and demand that the, the, there's no place for egos on the left, where people have got their own careers in mind, rather than who is going to win and make Stephanie bloody well win. I agree with Thank that, Ken. Uh, Christine, you indicated. Then Thank Kevin. you. Thank you, Chris. And it's, it's an absolute honour to be part of this with, with the NUM. We miss you all seeing you all so very much and uh, fingers crossed at some point soon we will. Um, I just wanted to kind of, you know, I was really inspired, Ken, as, as always by what you said, um, but particularly that, that Orwell quote about, um, you know, the past was erased, the erasure was forgotten and the lie became the truth. Uh, because in the All Group campaign, we're, we're still battling against that lie being the truth the truth about what the strike was about, the truth uh, about how it was uh, manu manipulated and manufactured, um, and you know the truth about what happened to those 95 people and how they were, um, you know, dragged through the system. Um, mm. But we're in a situation now where the lie becoming the truth has gone even further. Um, and I just wondered what your thoughts were about the um, piece of legislation. Um, that's uh, now gone for royal assent, the Covert Human Intelligence Sources Bill, because nobody knows more than this proud union um, about covert interference in legitimate industrial action. Um, and that's, I'm afraid, what this government has now legislated for, for, um, for covert operatives to be able to have immunity 
from criminal behavior, committing criminal acts in the interest of what will be deemed to be the economic well-being of the country. And let's face it, the Tories will deem any bit of industrial action as something that's going to damage the economic well-being of the, the country. So I just find we are in very, very dark days with that legislation. Mm -hmm. And it feels it is the true legacy of what the government back then wanted the world to be in 21st century. Um, mm -hmm. So that's not a very cheerful comment. I, I wanted just to give you some cheer though, because the other legacy of that strike um, was working class women finding um, and being listened to, finding their voices and being listened to, a huge inspiration to my generation. And we've got some amazing young women trade unionists now coming through and picking up the fight. And we're going to need them because we know that the papers that we would so you know, dearly want to see regarding the policing of the miners' strike are embargoed until 2066. So we need our young activists to pick up this, this struggle in case we don't well, break well. that through before. Thank you, Chris. Can I... Kevin? No, oh, Chris. Um, I was just thinking about uh, about Kez. I'm trying to bring Kez into it. Um, I remember when I, I, I left school, I walked out to pit gates and, and at the school gates and the pit were there. And just like just like him, really, and, uh, and I lived on a pit estate, uh, concrete canyons, we used to call them. Um, and they were, they were policed by our fathers. Um, when you walked around the estate and did anything wrong, um, they'd tell your dad and your dad give you a clip like that's how it was and um, and now the, the so-called concrete canyons are drug dens it's, a, it's the only thriving South Yorkshire now drugs um, uh, nobody wants to live in these concrete canyons anymore uh, but unfortunately they've got to uh, live away landlords who bought the, the houses and streets for a few pounds when the pits closed. Um, uh, but uh, like I say, we, we're glad to get away from, I'm glad to get away from there. I mean, I live in Mexico, which is not a great, great thing. But um, since, since the pits shut, you know, uh, my sons and that are working in warehouses and call centres and things like that, which pay very little. And, and it's a shame to see strong young men who would have made brilliant miners uh, walking walk to these, strike, uh, these call centres to sit down all day. Um, that's all I've got to say, really. Uh, it's, it is a shame, Kevin, that... Uh, that we lost as, as identity in some of these areas. Can I bring Dick in, Dick? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah, at the end of Ken's presentation, uh, he summed it up. He said, we need to keep on fighting, and I totally agree. The difficulty we have is, and without upsetting anyone in this room, uh, apart from Joe, and I'd say Chris, because there's three Chrises in the room, uh, the rest of us are all of a let's say a certain age or certain ages. We are not the youth of the movement. I'm just wondering what Ken's thoughts are on uh, how do we encourage young members, you know, how do we encourage the youth to get involved with the, the movement? How do we make them aware of past struggles? And how do we encourage them to continue fighting on our behalf and, and their own behalf? Thank you. Ken, your thoughts on... Uh... Um, how do we engage the youth? Um, well, I, I think it's, it's, it's how do you engage anybody, really? I, I think you just start with where they are, you know, what, what, what's their concern? Um, the, the, those that, that are, are prepared to be concerned, what's their concern? What, 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 are the, what struggles do they face? 
and we just start with that. You know, I mean, now it will be the struggle, but where's the job? Where's the decent job? A lot will have been to university. Um, I mean, maybe half or more, um, but where's the jobs that will reflect their education? Um, and begin with that, you know, and, and, and it, it's, it's strange how politics has changed, you know, the, the cliche is it's identity politics, not class politics, and, and that's a real limitation, um, because it can tend to divide us, and, and you know, if, because, you know, within the working class now, there will be different, there will be people will identify differently, whether it's on the, you know, we can all think of the differences that we can see, but what unites us is, is what's critical. So I think, I think starting where, where, where the young ones are, um, and again, it comes back to having, and I, I can only see it in terms of unions or, or community organizations that, that will organize with younger people, absolutely at the place where, where people are, talking about their own, the, the struggles the difficulties they face but the one thing the, 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 the older ones can pass on is, is the basic analysis that this is a class society driven by conflicting interests and not to go for the propaganda that we're in it together. It's not. Whether people are, want it or not, that conflict of interest between the need for profit and the need for security and decent lives and dignity and security in every aspect from whether it's homes or health or work or whatever and that's the essential conflict and then that's that's the center i think of, of our politics so we whatever we can pass on that's what we pass on and but, but we we help to build organizations that are that are based on where people are and supporting them in their in their very specific struggles, you know. We, we, in a way, we, we can't fight the miners' strike again, but we can fight the precarious work. You know, we we, we that that we can fight. So let it, it's back to the it's grassroots organisation. It has to come from the grassroots. It's a, to, and it's a, it's it's an absolutely significant point significant point and and what is our political voice now i mean that is another huge political issue um is the labor party there to be reclaimed if it my hunch is it still is maybe just or how do we i mean that i don't know the answer to that but 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 that that's a, a huge political question because we have to have a political voice we've got to have an industrial voice and we've got to have a political voice i think it's a very good point that a better, a better life for ourselves and future generations. No matter what you're striving to do, whether it's better education, better housing, it all seems to be built on, on the foundation of, of decent, secure, well-paid employment. You can't send your kids to university without the funding to do it. You can't you know, in, buy, buy a house, no matter how many there is there or how, how well they are. I mean, you, you need that basic foundation, and that is the foundation of the of the trade union movement, is to secure, you know, employment rights for everybody. And bring Kate Flannery in, Kate. Thank you, and thanks, Ken, for the wonderful speech, as always. Um, you've covered quite a lot of issues, um, and obviously I want to pull it back a little bit to the issue around film and the influence of film. Uh, I mean, during the election, we used your film uh, that made reference to Amazon. Sorry, we missed you. But in, in, in response to Dick as well about how we engage young people, we've worked incredibly closely with Lesbians and Gays Support the Minors, who use the film Pride to retell the story of their involvement in supporting mm. minors during the strike and the whole strike. And that's really kind of inspired a younger generation. And in the All Grief campaign, we've been able to work closely and use that film to inspire a whole new generation of, of young people who weren't aware of what was going on many years ago but also retell the story as you talk about the history and history is often rewritten to retell the story to people who were involved, but 
in some ways have forgotten all about it and have forgotten about solidarity because their communities have been destroyed and their livelihoods have been taken away. And I think if you could just say a little bit more, please, about, about the influence of art and culture and film and how we could use that to engage more people. Um, I, think, I think that would be a real inspiration for getting particularly young people involved and bringing them up through the movement. Um, okay, Chris. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, well, it, it's a good point. I mean, it, it's, it's difficult because um, the film industry in terms of making films um, doesn't want to make these films and they're I mean, at a feature film level, they're, they're, they're proper um, industrial, uh, I mean, in investments and, and then people invest them expecting to make money. And so, it, it, and, and, the, um, and the arty lots who often have state funds, you know, are, are on a different planet. So it's often quite, I mean, there's, there's brilliant writers, there's brilliant directors who would make these films, but of course they don't get the chance. And, you know, that, that, that's the problem. Um, but yes, it, it, it can function. It, I mean, it, they can work well. Um, and often there are now short films done um, that they can start a meeting, you know, say a 10, 11, 15 minute film, they will kick you off into a, into a meeting, or you can use a section from a existing films. Um, and so, yes, it, I mean, just simple rec rec recording of, of people's memories. You know, I mean, everyone on this meeting would be worth an, would be worth a film. You know, everyone will have memories. Everyone will have a, a something precise, something precise that just illuminates the whole story. And th that's where our strength is. You know, you, you've all got amazing memories. I mean, your grand, well, grandchildren, children, neighbours, kids, talk to them. Let them do a fifteen-minute piece about what, what, what I know from, from from the strike, what I can pass on, what I want to say to my grandchildren. Again, Tony Ben did letters to his grandchildren, didn't he? A book, and everyone's got that in them. So do pass it on, and they're all valuable, you know. And and that one thing we learned from when we did I Daniel Blake about the benefit system was that the distributor um, put money into um, community screenings. We had 700 screenings or more in over pubs, in community centres, in football clubs, um, wherever you could gather people. Um, and the, the distributors let, let it be hired out for, I think it was 80 quid, but you could charge for them. You could charge it. Charities did it. They had them as, you know, used it for collections and, and then to talk about why there, why there were food banks. Why had food banks arisen? You know, because poverty was seen as a crime and people had to be punished with hunger as the ultimate deterrent. You know, and, and we had, there'd be maybe 100, 150 people each screen. So, so they can work, you know, we can make it work. We've just got to be inventive and imaginative and put things on and maybe work with one or two good teachers in the schools. Because teachers are brilliant. A lot of teachers are brilliant. They really get it, you know. Um, and so we, we do have a network and I think it's finding those networks um, and putting on a screening and getting a few kids in and they'll talk to others. So yes, it, and songs, you know, I mean, there's great musicians will sing a, songs that are rooted in, in, in resistance and it doesn't have to be our specific struggle. I mean, it you know, can relate to anti-imperialist struggles, struggles for freedom because we all tie in, you know, we all tie in. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, and it can lift our spirits as well, you know. I mean, the, I mean, to be invited to a meeting to hear a bunch of old farts like, I, you know, talk about the strike <laughs> may not attract too many, but, you know, a young singer who gets some of the old songs and some new ones. And then out of that, you say, now what are those songs really about? You know, so th there's, yeah, we've just got to be imaginative, haven't we? Oh, it's a really good point. Oh, good to see you again, Case, and Chris, and everyone. <laughs> just picking up on that, that one point that you made about making it all worthy of a film, I've, I'm reminded that when I did my first TV interview, Ken, 
my mother phoned me up and told me that I'd definitely got a face for radio. <laughs> um, but uh, moving on, uh, Mr. Mr. Skidmore. I really, really wanted to avoid having to say it. You're on mute, Mr. Skidmore. <laughs> I've got sound and vision now. <laughs> we have sound and vision. It's uh, it's not a rant and it's not a ramble, but in order to uh, to try and have a full circle and pull things together, uh, normally this day is a commemoration and a rem and reminding people of what we stand for. Um, we don't, and also, sometimes it gets forgotten about the three young lads from Goldthorpe area who got killed picking coal. It's a Paul and Darren Holmes and Paul Womersley. And that sometimes gets lost uh, because, and I'm minded at the time we were with the Orgreaves to some justice per, per campaign down in the Home Office, where a, a person who, I mean, I've always thought that politicians should actually earn people's respect before they become a, a politician not just uh, put their own slant on what they think is right and what they think is wrong. But I all remember the words, Kate, that, uh, that, that well, nobody was killed at Orgreave, so what do you want to, uh, an inquiry for? Well, I might remind people that we ne never had a proper inquiry as to why we lost David, uh, David uh, Jones and Joe Green. And if we hadn't had the strike, then the three lads wouldn't have got to pick and call. Um, well, also, I, mean, I dare say that there were some people who think that uh, we're all insular and that we don't lament the fact that uh, the taxi driver got killed in South Wales. But I can assure you that, uh, that nobody intended to kill the taxi driver in South Wales, but they just showed how the system worked that, uh, that, that Russell and, uh, and Ken got uh, immediately, it was murder. So that shows the, the, the intensity that was that was raised against the, the miners. That it wouldn't matter if and, and the amount of what I also like to mention and about what Ken's uh, thoughts are on the amount of people who were sacked for taking part in the, this strike. And it's never that far away from people's memories. And we, we've, we, you know, we, we've made points about uh, about the, the, how the political spectrums changed, and, I, and one of the reasons, one of the things that I would always have, have tried to champion is that we've got to, we've got to make it that it's fashionable, it's fashionable to, again to, to to actually take part in a struggle and try and achieve something. And we never want, you know, obviously it's great when we've got our own way. It's great when we've, we've actually achieved what we need to achieve. But part of the achievement is the struggle itself. And actually turning people's minds to, well, you know, that this is still going on in some, some format, somewhere or another. I mean, I was appalled, basically, about the, in a lot of constituencies, about how there was a lack of fortitude displayed and they just appeared to just cast aside. There were a lot of, uh, shall we say, the old guard in the Labour Party were finishing. Most the same as we were with the, after the strike when a lot of the old guard or the, the, the branch officials disappeared. But we were left then to try and pick up pieces. And now, to a shame, as I call it, we've got, we've got constituencies that's, that's based on what Kevin was saying and what Dick's been saying earlier on, that they're based on a, a, com a coming together and a feeling that we, yes, in this situation, we do care about each other, but we've now faced, when we, it's interesting again, Ken, when you've talked about the benefit system, we see this every day. We see it every day, and, and Chris knows that I, I do get very passionate about it, but in order for it, just as, a, as an example to everybody, I like to try and give people an example on, on the David Jones, Joe Green, that, uh, that, yeah, it might seem as though it's been pushed to one side. But let's not forget that the employer in the mining industry was the, was the government from 1947 onwards until 1994. 
And now all the seem intent upon doing is ensuring that people don't get the benefit that they're entitled to when they've been made ill by their by their ineptitude. And as a, as a lady who's, uh, I'm doing a claim for it this moment in time, and if you want, she's lost her husband. And the judge, the appeal that was adjourned last week, asked me to get all the medical records. And this is where we, we find the inequality that exists, that we're not bothered, even though we've told MPs, because it's happened before, that if that lady wants her husband's medical records, She's either got to get a grant to probate, which is £250. She's to have a, a copy of a will or a copy of a letter of administration. Now, these days, you don't make a will for your nearest and dearest. You certainly don't want a grant to probate and you don't get a letter of administration. But if she wants justice, she's going to have to pay £250 to get old. No mind what the judge says in the case, because I've sent copies of what the judge has asked me to do. Oh, the place in, uh, in, in Darlington, the NHS archives. And we've put this before. Yeah, John Trickett's put it, Stephanie Peacock's put it. Those are MPs that do try, by the way. And they put it to the minister. And they said, well, we've got, we, we've, got, we've got to have rules and regulations, you know. We can't just have anybody getting all the medical records. For Christ's sake, it's the widow. But she's got to pay for the for actually getting hold of those medical records. And that to me epitomizes that we've got a situation now where we haven't got enough MPs that know how to promote an argument. We haven't got enough MPs that want to champion causes, and we've got a set of spivs that's in charge of the government, because that's what they've been called in many years, spivs. But if they can give the cronies and the friends get con contracts at £881 million in, the, in this, what we call, well, one of the worst things that's happened to us since the Second World War. But if they can make money out of this, there's no, <laughs> there's no, there's no level which they won't stoke to. And what we have to do is see, as, as, as most of people in this, uh, at this meeting will agree to, I'm sure, that we have to inspire people that this isn't right. And yes, we might be talking about something as well said it was 30 odd years ago, but it's still fresh in here. And it's still fresh in here because it hurts. And until people start recognizing the hurt that we feel, then I'm sorry, we're not going to achieve a great deal other than be a thorn in the side of the people who put us there in the first place. Thanks very much, Chris. <laughs> Sorry, for some reason, my space bar's not working now, so I've got to use my mouse. Anybody else that would like to make a quick contribution as we start to look at winding up? Just looking around the screen. Can't see no indications. Um, well, um, thank you very much, Ken, for, for your contribution to this year's David Jones Joe Green Memorial Lecture. I think um, we've all found it extremely inspiring, inspiring and informative. Um, I'm, I'm never very good at my words, Inky. <laughs> but uh, but I, I, I would like to thank you personally for, for, for taking the time to do today's event. Uh, it is important to us that, that we get some inspirational speeches, that we get people that's, that's got their own view on history, how things are today and how to make things better for the future. I know one thing that fills me with dread is when I hear people that are desperate to get back to normal after COVID-19. I think we're all wanting to get back to some kind of normality with regards to social interaction and, and being able to go to pub with mates and family. But um, given that, that COVID-19 has highlighted some of the um, inequality within our society, I'm not right sure whether I want to get fully back to normal, I think it could be a good time to change some of the things that, you know, that, that put those inequalities there that COVID highlighted during the pandemic. But thank you very much, Ken, for jump to come back in, Ken. Um, just, only just very briefly, and, and to say it's, 
it's been an absolute pleasure and an honour to to be with you. And um, I, I, I mean, I'm it's always I'm always really touched when um, when I come to the building in Barnsley, and it, it's it's such an important building, and and your union is so important, um, and um, your members are so important. The only thing I just wanted to add was that there's a lot of people like like you like who say what we say all over the country, you know, we are not on our own. Um, do link up. Um, I mean, the, I live down in the Southwest and there's, there's, a, there's a, a number of people, a large number of people who actually know what's going on. And some of them are in the Labour Party struggling away. Some have walked away in disgust. There are people in unions who know what we're saying. And we do have much more strength than we imagine. And we've got to find, a, do turn outwards, do link up with them, do make, I mean, there's people in Liverpool, you'll know the people in Liverpool. I mean, brilliant people, people in the Northeast, people in London, brilliant people. And we somehow never, we never achieve the, the unity of action that we need, you know? And there are people like I know who would cheer you to the echo. So we've really got to link up, you know, link across and, you know, to, the old phrase, I mean, we are many, they are few. We are many, you know? So let's take heart from that. But just to say thanks, see you in person before too long and keep going. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, and with that, I, uh, I draw this year's memorial lecture to a close. I thank everybody for uh, your, your virtual attendance. Um, like I say, heartfelt thanks to Ken for, for taking part in this year's lecture. And hopefully this time next year, we will all be in person in the offices in Barnsley where we can share a cup of tea and coffee with each other and, uh, and some, some old tales and, and inspire each other and support each other to try and make the world a better place for ourselves and future generations. Thank you very much, Ken. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.